Okay, so uh, first of all, I have to say that we are we are honored to have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Lee Kwong, to visit us here from uh, all the way from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, for those of you uh, uh, who are attending the seminar series for the very first time, uh, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to attend the, uh, the seminar series here, hosted by the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. Uh, the short name is Win. The uh, purpose of this WIND seminar series is to invite world-class leaders uh, in nanoscience and nanotechnology to come to Waterloo and uh, to get the chance that you get to meet with these world-class scientists in person. Dr. Huang is the Fred Eshelman Distinguished Professor and the Chair Professor uh, at the Division of Molecular Pharmaceutics in the Eshelman School of Pharmacy in the University of North Carolina. And uh, for those of you uh, who are not very familiar with the professorial system, uh, the distinguished professor and the chair professors, these are the uh, symbols and testaments uh, of Dr. Huang's achievement in science, uh, his contributions in medicine, nanomedicine and research. And finally, it's about the way that the, the ultimate fail of response and uh, respect uh, by the colleague and his peers. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Huang's past and uh, before we get started. Dr. Huang received his bachelor in physics uh, from the National Taiwan University. And in 1969, he came to the United States uh, to the Michigan State University where he did his uh, PhD. His uh, career as a professor started at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in 1976. And then in 1991, he was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh uh, where he served as the director for the Center of Pharmacogenetics, uh, and also he carries the title of the Joseph Kosovo Professor of Pharmaceutical Sciences. In 2005, Dr. Huang moved to the University of North Carolina, um, where now he is the chair of the Division of Molecular Pharmaceutics, and, uh, um, and then, uh, then he works currently do his research. Overall, and so far in his career, Dr. Huang has published well over 300 papers, and he's been invited to uh, give hundreds of uh, invited lectures and seminars worldwide. And uh, today we'll hear from Dr. Huang and his research uh, with respect to nanoparticle delivery of sRNAs. It's a true privilege that we have Dr. Huang here today with us. Please join me and give a warm, warm welcome to Dr. Huang. Thank you for a very kind introduction. Um, for those of you who have not heard about University of North Carolina, that's where Michael Jordan come from. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to talk about basketball. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you a, a progress report of uh, the way we deliver siRNA, to mostly to the tumor, but recently we also delivered that to the uh, liver. So. Um, before I start, I wanted to tell you a uh, prediction which is made by some magazines. And uh, this is predicting the top 10 drug sales in the world in 2014, which is not very far from now. And you can see that on this list of the drugs in here, only three of them are small molecules. And they rank number seven, eight, and 10. So the most of them are either monoclonal antibody or recombinant proteins. So you can see that the trend of the drug industry is moving towards macromolecules. And these macromolecules, which is already on the market and enjoy a very good sale, they are mostly uh, working on a extracellular or cell surface target. And reason why is because these macromolecules cannot penetrate into the cell. So the drug that has been established does not require a sophisticated technology to deliver them into the cell. But if such a technology exists, there is an enormous amount of target that one can think of, and one can design a macromolecular drug against it. So this is really the beginning of the era for drug delivery technology. And what I'm going to tell you today is nanotechnology that used for drug delivery intracellularly. OK, 
So the molecule that I'm going to tell you most of my time is siRNA, which stands for small interfering RNA. So this is coming out from the discovery uh, some years ago about RNA interference. So what is known that when a large double-strand RNA ended up in the cytoplasm of a cell, they are actually processed by a dicer molecule into some small siRNA. And these are double-strand RNA, about 19 to 20 base pairs, and has a two nucleotide overhand on each side. The intracellular target, called RISC, is in the cytoplasm. And that binding actually triggers a complementary strand binding to this so-called single strand of siRNA. And that binding triggers a ribonuclease that will cleave the complementary mRNA. So the result is that you don't have mRNA of that uh, uh, particular protein, and of course, you have a silence of that protein function in the cell. So the siRNA therapy is a loss of function therapy, very similar to the small molecular weight drugs. So most of the drug we take will end up in inhibiting a receptor or an enzyme or something. So you have a loss of function therapy. At the very end of my talk, I'm going to tell you about gene therapy, which is a gain of function therapy. So you introduce a new gene into the cell, and the expression of the new gene, you come up with a, a gain of a new function. So these two types of uh, therapy, they are complementary to each other. So siRNA, although they're small, they're still macromolecules. They cannot easily go into the cell. And there are barriers to deliver siRNA to the tumor. Today, we're going to mostly talk about tumor. The first barrier is, I call it a kinetic barrier, because siRNA, although they are macromolecules, they are too small to retain in the circulation. They are filtered very rapidly by the kidney. So in order to increase the size of the molecule, you have to encapsulate that in a, some kind of a nanoparticle. And also, encapsulation in the nanoparticle will protect the siRNA from degradation, because there's a lot of ribonuclease everywhere. So when you have a nanoparticle, then your number one enemy is the so-called RES. And that stands for reticular endothelial systems. And they are the macrophage molecules in the liver and in the spleen, and secondarily in the lung and in the bone marrow. Um, and therefore, it is very important that you have to have these nanoparticles ignored by RES. Because if not, you will lose most of the injected dose to the RES and not deliver to the, uh, to the uh, uh, target. So that's a kinetic barrier. So you want that your nanoparticle uptake rate by the RES significantly lower than the uptake rate by your target tissue. In this case, is tumor. So which one will win the race? You know, that's the, uh, that's the key. And second one, I call it the physical barrier. And that is nanoparticle, of course, even bigger than the macromolecule itself, it itself cannot cross the membrane. So usually it is endocytosed. And therefore, it is very important that the nanoparticle, and at least its cargo, has to be able to escape from the endosome. So the endosomal membrane is a very important physical barrier. For siRNA, you only need to stop at the cytoplasm because the risk complex is there. But for the DNA, you, need, you have a one more barrier that is the moving into the nucleus. And there's another nuclear membrane barriers that you have to worry about. So all these barriers, how do you overcome these barriers, is the science of drug delivery. Now, 
our work started by this formulation called LPD. We originally designed the LPD formulation for delivering of DNA. But, sorry, but we have modified the formulation to deliver sRNA. So this is a self-assembly process, consists of three steps. The first step is that you have your negatively charged molecules, and we found that sRNA itself is insufficient. We have to have a high molecular weight polyanion as a carrier. Together, they can then condense with a positively charged protein called the protamine. Protamine is the major protein found in the sperm. The reason why the entire human genome, which is huge in molecular weight, can be condensed into a small head of a sperm is because of this molecule called a protamine. And then the structure I'm going to show in the next slide. So they condense into a nanoparticle. And if you use an excess in the negative charge of the molecule, then there will be a net surface negative charge. And to which we then add cationic liposomes. The major cationic lipid is dotat. And they wrap around. And then the very last step, we add PEG. So you have this uh, exaggerated picture here showing the PEG chain sticking out. But the actual length of the PEG is much smaller. So you have a structure of core and membrane structure. So that's what we are talking about. So this is the structure of potamine. And you can see that it contains a lot of arginines. And this is a highly positively charged protein. <coughs> and they bind with DNA by charge interaction, neutralize the charge. And because the neutralization of the charge and the rid of the counter ion. So the DNA, very large DNA molecule, does not like that condition. So they fold, they condense with themselves into a small nanoparticle. And by doing so, they also condense the sRNA. And uh, the PEG molecule that we use to coat the surface of this nanoparticle is called DSPE PEG anisamide. This is the PEC part. On one end, it contains two fatty acid chain. The other end contains this anisomide molecule. And that is a ligand for sigma receptor. Sigma receptor is an epithelial cell marker. About 50% of the human cancer, they came from epithelium. So epithelial cells, when they transform into cancer cells, they overexpress the sigma receptor. So this has a binding affinity to the sigma receptor. As a control, we have a similar molecule, but there's no anisomide. So our hypothesis was that sRNA is so packaged in this nanoparticle, they are going to be relatively prolonged circulation because they should not be taken up by the RES so quickly. And because the larger size, they should not be filtered by the kidney. And they should be able to find the leaky vasculatures of the tumor and bind to the tumor cell surface sigma receptor and be endocytosed and release the sRNA intracellularly. And I want to bring your attention at this point. Sigma receptor is not tumor specific. Normal epithelial cells also express sigma receptor. The reason why our nanoparticles cannot see these normal epithelial cells is because the vessels that supply blood to these epithelial cells, they do not contain leaky holes. They don't have holes. But the vessels supply blood to the tumor are very leaky. So this is so-called EPI effect. In a minute, I will show you in more detail. It's by the leakiness of the vasculature that our nanoparticle are tumor specific. It's not by the presence of the ligand. 
So how leaky is the tumor vasculature? So you can see from this published paper, not from my laboratory, about 11 years ago, it shows one, two, three, four, five different human tumor. And you see that the vasculature leakiness range from almost non-leaky, very similar to normal endothelial cells, to very leaky. In this case, the hose is actually bigger than the size of the cell. So this is very leaky. But this extreme case, most of the tumor are somewhere in the middle. They're fairly leaky, but not as leaky as in this case. Now this is the EPI effect, which stands for Enhance the Permeability and Retention effect. Existing human, yes. For example, if you use the pegylated liposomes, and therefore they call, it, they call them stealth liposomes, uh, radio labeled, IV injected, you can see this individual has a very large lung tumor, and that lights up. Um, so if you don't use pegylated liposomes, then there will be nothing here. They'll be all in the RES, but even their stealth liposome pegylated, they're not perfect. They still have lost quite a bit of the injected dose to RES, liver, spleen, and bone marrow. So this is not perfect. Still, you know, needs improvement. So when my student, Star Lee, started this uh, experiment, he um, designed nanoparticles that are pegylated. So he used sRNA that was fluorescently labeled. And after tail vein injection into new to mice that contains this subcutaneous tumor called H460, which is a lung cancer, four hours after injection, he killed the animal, got all of the major organs, and he imaged. And he found that the organ that had taken up mostly the sRNA is the tumor, not liver. So this was a very surprise to me because we've been working on the liposome field for many years. We know that no matter how much of the peg you put around the liposomes, you should lose quite a bit to the tumor. But this case, the major organ of uptake is tumor. So, and also another thing which was surprised to me was that whether you have AA as a ligand or no AA as a ligand, you get a comparable result. So why do you need AA? So he then showed me this particular photograph. I hope you can see that. Maybe we should dim the lights a little. Ah, OK, thank you. Now you can sleep. <laughs> With AA, the sRNA distribution in the tumor is heterogeneous, but they are inside the tumor cells. They are not in the nucleus. You see the nucleus is blue. And you can see them in the sideways the best. You see they are not in the nucleus, but they are surrounding the nucleus in the uh, cytoplasm. But if you don't have AA, they are in the tumor, but they are outside the tumor cells. You can see that they don't surround a blue nucleus. So it is important to have a ligand, but the ligand, the function of the ligand in this case, is not for targeting to the tumor. It is for internalization, as you can see here. So with that much of uh, 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 sRNA internalized, one obviously have to ask the question, are they functional? So we use a sRNA against the EGF receptor, you know, this is the oncogene, uh, that are highly expressed in this lung cancer. So this is immunostaining. And you can see that the animal, if it's only injected with PBS, the tumor express a large amount of EGF receptor and this brown color. And free sRNA didn't do anything because free sRNA are quickly excreted by the uh, kidney and also they're degraded by the extracellular ribonuclease. But if you package sRNA in the nanoparticle that are targeted, 
and they are internalized, as shown in the last slide, you have a drastic reduction in the amount of the brown staining. If there's no AA here, we knew that the sRNA is in the tumor, but outside the tumor cells, and of course, they will not have much of the uh, down regulation. And if you use a targeted nanoparticle, but the, your sRNA is a control sRNA, not specific for EGF receptor, and of course, that has no effect. And uh, he also showed this by Western blot. So I had no time to explain what is a Western blot. It's a, it's, a, it's a molecular biology technique to detect a, a molecule, and in this case, the EGF receptor. You see that after three daily injections on the fourth day, you took entire tumor, you grind it up, you can't see the EGF receptor. So you have almost a total silencing of the target molecule. And they're specific because control sRNA has no effect in here. So this was uh, very uh, impressive. OK, so at this point, we begin to think, wow, this is amazingly good. Maybe one of these days, we're going to bring this formulation to a clinical trial. So we begin to ask questions, are other components of LPD inert? Because FDA is most concerned about safety. So potamine, probably yes, because potamine is a FDA approved drug. How about dotap and cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is probably not a problem. It's an endogenous molecule, and we don't inject that much. But how about dotap? Nobody knows about dotap. This is the structure of dotap. It is a quaternary amine lipid, two fatty acid chains, in this case is oleic acid, and a glycerol, glycerol uh, backbone in here. So no one knows about the uh, toxicity of dotap. So at that time, I had a rotation student by the name of Becky Chen. So I said, Becky, why don't you check whether dotap has anything to do with the uh, tumor cells? And after a few weeks, she showed me this piece of data. She said, the cells, these tumor cells, H4CT tumor cells, treated with dotap showed a transient activation of two molecules. One is called p erc and the other one is called Survivin. I said, wow, that's a bad news. Why? Because both molecules are known to be anti-apoptotic. So our goal is to kill that tumor cells. We want to induce apoptosis. But the components of our delivery system induces an anti-apoptotic activity, protecting the cells from death. That's bad, right? Fortunately, our freezer has a lot of cationic lipid. So I asked Becky, I said, go check them one by one. Uh, hopefully, we can find a cationic lipid that do not do this. <laughs> and he, she quickly found one. And this is called Discla. And it was synthesized by a postdoc a number of years ago. And she checked it on the p erc You see that instead of an activation, has a silencing effect. Although it's transient, they come back to the normal stage, but at least they don't do this activation. So I said, well, that's good. Now you have a transient inhibition of p erc That means this lipid, this clot, may potentiate the killing because in the silencing of this molecule here I may induce apoptosis. And therefore, she checked it. First of all, we need to know whether this GLA still can deliver sRNA. So she did that. So you see that when DOTAP is formulated with a nanoparticle contains AA, you see that EGF receptor is silenced. With this GLA, same thing happened. So that's good. So it's, it still can deliver sRNA. But how about apoptosis? This is a tunnel assay. If you see brown cells like this, that means the cell is dying. 
With DOTAP, although all of the EGF receptors are silenced, hardly you see any of the uh, brown cells in here. Why? Because DOTAP is protecting the cell from death. But if you keep everything the same, you change DOTAP, or lipid 1 is this GLAR, to this GLAR, then you see, you begin to see many more of the dead cells. And this is still dependent on the EGF sRNA, because if you look at it, control sRNA, you don't see that many of dead cells. So you've got to have both of the lipid and sRNA to induce this, and they are target specific. So that's very nice. And that's Becky Chan. <laughs> I will show their picture. So with that in mind, we then did the uh, tumor cell growth inhibition experiment. This experiment was not meant to be a therapy experiment. So we only inject three times in the beginning and then see how tumor grow. You can, there are a lot of lines in here. Most of them are controls. And just concentrate on this yellow line and this uh, red line. The yellow line is this, EGFR sRNA developed in the nanoparticles formulated with DOTAP. You know, this is a uh, protecting lipid. So no wonder you only have a partial killing effect. But if you keep everything the same, you replace DOTAP with this cloud. See how much of enhancement of the uh, tumor growth inhibition. So that's very nice. And furthermore, Becky wanted to also do the drug resistant cells. Now you may know that most of the tumor will respond to the chemo drugs when they first treat it. But after a while, the tumor will become drug resistant. And it's a drug resistant tumor that kills the patient. So if we can handle the drug resistant tumor, we, you know, we have come a long way. So in this experiment, she delivered a drug called a doxorubicin. And reason why was because doxorubicin intercalate into the DNA in the, between the bases like this. So in our formulation, Remember, we have DNA as a, as a carrier for sRNA. So we thought, well, if DNA can host uh, doxorubicin, why not add doxorubicin to our formulation as a complex with DNA? So now the DNA carries two molecules. It carries doxorubicin and carries sRNA. So doxorubicin is a red fluorescence. So you can see that this is a tumor section, and all the nucleus, most of the nucleus here, are purple. Why is purple? It's because the fluorescence of the, uh, of the uh, doxorubicin is red, and the nuclear is blue. So blue plus red is purple. So that means there's a large amount of doxorubicin delivered to the nucleus of these tumor cells. And that's exactly what we want. We want the anti-cancer drug to the nucleus of the, of the cancer, uh, cancer cells. And that is specific when you have a, the, the uh, AA ligand. Without AA, you don't have that, or only you have a few uh, uh, red cells. And free doxorubicin cannot be delivered there because these are drug resistant, and they have a pump to pump them out. And this is untreated, so almost the same as untreated. But notice this, in addition to the purple nucleus, it also contains blue color. What's blue? It's FITA, FITC labeled sRNA. So this formulation not only delivers doxorubicin, also delivers siRNA. So that's good news. That means that we can now co-deliver sRNA with the uh, Oh, they are Chinese in the audience. <laughs> Together, so this Chinese says, one stone, two birds. <laughs> okay, so we checked 
what sRNA we should deliver? At that time, it is known that the molecule that stands uh, uh, mostly responsible for the drug resistant phenotype is called peak glycoprotein. So we first tried sRNA against peak glycoprotein itself. But for some reason, that was never successful. So then Becky read in the literature, she found out that CMYK, this oncogene, and it's also a transcriptional factor, controls the transcription of peak glycoprotein. So we decided to deliver sRNA against CMYK. And sure enough, you can see the CMYK is gone if the nanoparticle contains the uh, ligand. How about peak glycoprotein? Peak glycoprotein is also partially down. Oh, that's great, wonderful. And this is best shown by looking at the peak glycoprotein immunostaining. This is a fluorescent staining. And you can see the green colors are peak glycoprotein. So this is the control, you know, no treatment here. And this is the treatment that contains CMYK sRNA, and also you have a targeting ligand, this combination almost wipe out all the green colors there. So we conclude that CMYK sRNA silenced both CMYK and peak glycoprotein in the tumor. And sure enough, this tumor resistant line where you, when you use the free dogs in here, they're totally resistant. They just grow same as, a, as, a, as if there's no, no drug there. But if you put the same drug in this targeted formulation together with CMYK, sRNA, you can see that you see the gross inhibition. Again, this is not meant to be a therapy experiment, so she only injects three times in the beginning and just let the tumor grow, uh, tumor go. You can see that there's gross inhibition. And this is mediated by caspase. You can see the caspase 3 is activated. So the Interpretation of this data is something like this. So this formulation contains both CMYK sRNA and doxorubicin. So when they enter into the cells, the dox is released, enter into the cells, and these dox are not pumped out. Ordinary free dox comes in, they get pumped out by this peak glycoprotein, and that's why the cells are resistant to dox. But Dogs enter into this way through the back door are not pumped out. They accumulate in the nucleus. In addition to that, you have the sRNA that are released, which is inhibit the CMYK, and therefore you have a whole slew of uh, these uh, cellular processes all inhibited. So a combination of these two becomes a very potent gross inhibition. All right. Star is also interested in the uh, metastasis. So we have to switch to another model, a melanoma model, called B16F10. So these cells are melanoma. When they grow in the lung as a metastatic lesions, if they overgrown, that lung will turn, break, uh, turn black because the melanoma cells, they still produce melanin. And in this model, STAR had injected a mixture of three therapeutic sRNA, MDM2, CMYK, and VEGF. Only two injections. Six days later, he took the uh, lung from the mouse. And you can see that these are the lungs from individual mice. Untreated one, large amount of tumor. The lung is black. Free sRNA didn't do anything. sRNA in the non-targeted particles also didn't do anything because they don't enter into the cell efficiently. But sRNA in the targeted nanoparticles, there's a significant reduction in the tumor load compared to the control. And this is targeted nanoparticle but contains a irrelevant control sRNA, has no effect. So this is a wonderful piece of work. And uh, at this point, Starr had published uh, three first author papers, and he wanted to graduate. <laughs> <laughs>
And I said, no. <laughs> I said, why is your formulation so effective? Everybody else's formulation go to the liver and spleen. Why is your formulation so magic that can evade RES? You have to answer that question. So his formulation has a very low liver uptake. So he stayed in my laboratory for six more months and he solved this problem. By the way, Star is now in Toronto. He's a uh, faculty member, junior PI in the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Is that the name? Okay. He's doing very well there. Anyway, so he, I will summarize his finding. It is well known from other people's paper, this is a, from a theoretical calculation paper, that if you have a very thick, dense peg on the liposome membrane, it will form a brush. But it requires at least 8 more percent density. If you have only sparse uh, peg, then these peg are mushrooms. And between mushrooms, they all have these holes. The reason why liposomes or our lipidic nanoparticle are picked up by the RES is because the protein adsorption on the surface. If you have a brush, then the adsorption is minimal. And therefore, you have a minimal amount of RES uptake. The problem of liposomes is that if you add this level of the peg, this density of PEG, your liposome no longer a liposome because these molecules are detergent. At high concentration, they dissolve the liposome membrane. You lose all your cargo. So the maximum amount of PEG that can be loaded on the liposome surface is about 5 more percent, right here. So they can form a brush. Star put in 10 more percent. So when he first told me he had a 10 mole percent. I said, you must be crazy. <laughs> it can be. But then I thought about, well, you know, our nanoparticle is not a traditional liposome. Our nanoparticle, the interior of that membrane is not water. It's a condensed matter. It is a complex of potamine and DNA and RNA. So they actually have very little water there. So in this case, they will allow protein adsorption. And this will not allow protein adsorption. And this will call opsonization. And this is called no opsonization. The word opson in Greek means you put something on your food to make your food delicious. For example, you put butter on the bread, the bread becomes delicious. <laughs> You put protein on the nanoparticle, the nanoparticle becomes delicious to the macrophage. So the key point is that you have to inhibit this opsonization. And these molecules are detergent, as I mentioned. You can't put on enough of this uh, uh, pick to form a brush. But ours can, because our bilayer is a supported bilayer. Remember, you have the core, and then you put it on the lipid. The lipid and the core, there's a charge interaction. So this bilayer becomes super stable. And therefore, we can put in a very thick brush opaque. And you can see that if you prepare LPD with zero pack, Huge amount of Kufa cell uptake. These are Kufa cell. This is the liver. If you put on 5 more percent, this will be the so-called stealth liposome level of PEG. Yes, there's a tremendous amount of reduction of the uh, RES uptake, but it's not zero. It still lost quite a bit of uh, the dose to the RES. But if you put on 10 more percent, zero uptake. You can completely avoid RES. And that's the reason why he succeeded. So he published one more paper, and he graduated. 
It only took him two and a half years to, pop, uh, to graduate. This is an amazing guy. By the way, he, when he graduated, he also got married. He married another student of mine. So, <laughs> so it's a lab romance. So I told Star, I said, the only way you can get married is to marry a lab mate because he spent all his time in the lab. <laughs> so I encourage this type of lab romance. <laughs> I just want to remind you that we were the first one to publish in 1990 about pegylation of liposomes. At that time, postdoc Professor Klibanov, he's now a, a professor at the uh, University of Virginia. And in collaboration with Professor Mariyama, he's also a professor in Japan, they did this experiment. They put peg on the liposomes. Sure enough, when they look at the blood circulation time and liver uptake, the more PEC they put it on, the prolonged, the circulation is prolonged, and liver uptake is reduced. I said, fantastic. How about putting more PEC? I want this circulation even prolonged more. Klebanov told me that, no, I cannot, because if I put more, liposome dissolves. No more liposomes. So we knew that back in 1990. It took us 18 years to solve this problem. We are not that bright. <laughs> 18 years is not short time. It took us a long time to solve this problem. Well, two years ago, we four co-authors, unplanned, we just happened to be in Brazil in the same conference. We took a picture. So 18 years later, the only thing in common is that we all overweight. <laughs> <laughs> all right, star's gone. Now new student joined the lab. So I told him all the good work of star. He was very frustrated. He said, all the good works are done by star. What is there for me now? <laughs> I said, just look, take a look of star's data. This green fluorescence, sRNA, this is a slice of the tumor. And look at that. Yes, star had delivered an enormous amount of sRNA into the tumor because he had engineered that membrane very well, had a brush there. But look at all these green colors are the in dots, which means these sRNA are still in the nanoparticle. They're not released. They're not free. They're not bioavailable. I said, if all these sRNA could come out as a free sRNA, we probably can reduce the effective dose by at least a hundredfold. I said, that's your job. <laughs> well, he took the challenge. We scratch our heads. How are we going to do that? Well, Star did a wonderful job on the membrane, but he did nothing on the core. So we said, we have to change the core. To so change the core to what? To something that it can disassemble. Something will allow the sRNA to come out. So we decided to change the core to calcium phosphate. I have to take it credit at this point. When I was young, I was in Taiwan, I loved to drink soda. Soda was expensive at that time for, the, for my family. So my mother told me that, don't drink too much soda. Soda is acidic, it's gonna rot your teeth. So from young, I knew that calcium phosphate is acid sensitive. <laughs> you know, I should put my mother as a co-author. <laughs> my mother made a very strong contribution. So I told postdoc Jun Li, I said, let's place, replace the core of LPD with calcium phosphate. And of course, we cannot call it LPD anymore. 
So we call them LCP. CP stands for calcium phosphate. By the way, this is not hydroxyapatite, not like our teeth or bone. They are not crystal. This is an amorphous calcium phosphate. Ratio of calcium to phosphate is approximately one to one. So never mind how he made it. He made it. You know, this is the evidence. He made it. And then he published a paper. And meanwhile, he developed a second version of LCP. So we call them LCP2. LCP2 is the one that we are using now. And I'm going to tell you more about it. It's done by a double emulsion method. One emulsion contains phosphate, and the other emulsion contains calcium and SRNA or other drugs. You can put them in here. When you mix the two together at appropriate pH, they form precipitate. What is unique about LCP2 is that we add one more molecule, which is a phospholipid called the dioleo phosphatidic acid or DOPA, into this emulsion. Why is that? The theory is this. This free phosphate group should participate in, in the calcium phosphate formation. And if so, nanoparticles should be coated with a single layer of DOPA. If that's the case, then these calcium phosphate nanoparticles should be soluble in chloroform. And indeed, that's the case. We were the first in the world to make organic solvent soluble calcium phosphate nanoparticles. We were not the first to make calcium phosphate nanoparticles, but we were the first one to make them soluble in chloroform because they're coated with a single layer of DOPA. Why we want to do that? Well, look at it. This is the final <coughs> particle we want to make. We want to have a calcium phosphate core that encapsulates sRNA and then coated with a single lipid bilayer. If our inner leaflet of the lipid bilayer is already coated, as shown in here, by DOPA, then the remaining job is simply just add the outer leaflet lipids. And you can add any type of lipid you want to. So this resulting lipid bilayer here is the asymmetric lipid bilayer. They're supported lipid bilayer, they're asymmetric. <coughs> and you can still pegylate them, of course. Well, what surprised us is that these LCP2 are considerably smaller than LCP1. This bar is 50 nanometer. So the average size is somewhere around 20 to 30. Now this is without staining, so you only see the core, you cannot see the lipid layer. And they are hollow in structure. So doesn't matter the hollowness, OK? That's not important. Um, so in order to show that this works, this is the hypothesis. When they go into the endosome, they see this acidic environment. So they deassemble, this nanoparticle deassemble. And sRNA should be released. And because the increasing osmotic pressure, the water should rush in and pop the endosome, and SRNA should come out. And the first thing that we want to do at that time is to see where the calcium comes out. Because when they pop, the calcium should come out. So we decided to use a calcium-sensitive dye called a FIRA2. So FIRA2 in the absence of calcium is orange-red in color. When calcium concentration goes up, they turn green. And this is the cells. The label was FIRA2. Most of the cells are orange red. A few minutes after you add LCP particles, these cells turn from orange red to green, orange red to green, so on and so forth. So indeed, our hypothesis is right. There is a dissolution of the calcium phosphate and at least calcium comes out. Okay. How about sRNA? We really don't worry about calcium. We want to know sRNA. So Jin Lee made this experiment. He compares STARS formulation, LPD. And again, he uses the green labeled, FITC labeled sRNA. 
You can, yeah, you can see that these cells are loaded with sRNA, but they're granular looking. That means they're still stayed in the nanoparticles. But if you change the core to calcium phosphate, look at it, how much of the fluorescence is now evenly distributed in the cytoplasm. Not 100%. You still have some punctate fluorescence, but a lot of evenly distributed fluorescence. And when he assayed for the sRNA silencing activity, these tumor stably express luciferase. So he uses sRNA against luciferase. And this is shown in the log scale in here. And this is the silencing of the luciferase. And this curve here is LPD, the star formulation. And this curves here are LCP2. That's his new formulation. There's a 40-fold difference in here. So indeed, by changing the core from something that are not sensitive to acid to something sensitive to acid, we have increased the delivery efficiency of the nanoparticle by 40-fold in this experiment. Well, does this work in vivo? Yes. He now uses a red-labeled sRNA. And you can see that if you put in enough of the pig on the surface, he's able to deliver that to tumor. Still some in the liver. Star's nanoparticle only requires 10 more percent of pig. But he, his particle requires 23 more percent. We routinely use 25 more percent. Why is that? Originally, we did not understand. Then, one day, a student came into the laboratory and said, oh, that's easy, because these particles are a lot smaller. You know, when a larger particle, at 10 more percent, you have a brush. But with 10 more percent, when you reduce the particle size, which also increase the curvature, so your, your brush is no longer a brush. So you have to put in more. OK, so that's the reason why. So it's pretty tricky. The small size is not, uh, not easy to deal with. That's the drawback of this LCP2. And we're able to do the experiment like what Star did with um, sRNA, therapeutic sRNA in this melanoma uh, situation. And also with solid tumor, we're able to treat them with these three different therapeutic sRNA. Now with the dose which is a lot lower than the LPD. LPD require about one to two milligrams per kilo. And also, there's no cytotoxicity of the CLCP. We could tell. We check that these cytokines, they're all the same as untreated control, which is here. So in summary, we're able to enhance the activity of the nanoparticle by using the cell CP2. And you can see that the, not for the subcutaneous model, you need about 2 milligram per kilo. But for the LCP2, you need a lot less. Finally, I'm going to spend just two, three slides to tell you about our liver work. We also wanted to deliver sRNA to the hepatocyte. So Jun, Chun Sun Zhao had made the LCP2 particles. And he uses this Texas Red labeled double-strand DNA as a model for sRNA. sRNA is too expensive. So we use DNA. And the LCP2 is targeted with a trivalent galactose, which is this structure here. One, the peg is in the middle, and lipid here, and trivalent peg. Intravenously injected, liver taken at four hours, and sectioned. Hepatocyte stay, uh, labeled with Alexa 488 phalodin which binds with actin in the cytoskeleton. So you see green fluorescence. That is the cytoskeleton of the uh, hepatocyte. Now, I probably have to dim the lights again. Sorry about that, Frank. So the first panel is the liver section of untreated animal. And therefore, you don't see any red. Only see the green cytoskeleton and blue nuclei. And this is. Animal treated with LCP particles, but 
there's no galactose in there. So the uptake is minimal. There's a small amount of red in the cytoplasm, not much. This is what happens when you have the um, galactose. That's one version. And the other version, we're able to make their liver red. <laughs> and every hepatocyte is filled with this, uh, this red fluorescence. So post-doc Yun Xiaohu took over this job, uh, this, uh, this project. We wanted to try a sRNA delivered to treat a chronic disease. And this is a disease called a fatty liver disease. It's not alcohol related. And the sRNA we use is anti-CD36, which is a fatty acid translocator. In order to the liver become fat, in a full of fatty liver, fat, fat droplet, you need to transport fatty acid from the blood into the liver. And if you silence this translocator, then you should cut down the fatty droplet. So in this experiment, she injected, she, we put this uh, mice in this fat di uh, this diet called the MCT, uh, N MCD diet. Four injections, Kelvin injections. And you can see that at day 15, when she harvests these uh, livers, she did the uh, CD38 Western. And you can see that the nanoparticle contains CD38 that are galactose targeted, had about only about one third of the CD38 left. The one without galactose still has more, but only a partial. And more important is this one here. In this diet, if you don't treat them, the, there's a full of fatty droplets in the liver. You can see that, right? But if you treat them with CD36 sRNA in this nanoparticle that contains galactose as a, a, as a targeting ligand, you see this significant reduction of the fatty droplets. And we use a control sRNA, no effect. So, this is the first time that a chronic metabolic disease could be treated with nanomedicine. And then more recently, Yin Xia shocked me with this particular piece of data. She put it on red fluorescent protein plasma DNA. So now this is a gain of function therapy that I talked about at the beginning of my talk. So if you see if you could express this gene, this is a marker gene, not a therapy gene. This is a huge plasma DNA, about six point some kilo base. IV injected, formulated in LCP, IV injected. You see the liver lights up, that candle. We don't understand why kidneys also lights up. We need to worry, we need to handle this problem. This is supposed to be liver specific. But let me also remind you, there's a set of uh, organs here that are untreated. In this setting, they're almost invisible. So this is a tremendous amount of liver gene expression in here. So in short, our nanoparticle is at a, at a stage where we know they can avoid RES, they can target to the target cells, and they enter the endosomes, they dissolve because of the acid, and release the cargo. And if the cargo is sRNA, then you have get a very good silencing effect. And this cargo, in this case, is a big plasma DNA. This still has expression. We don't know how much of the plasma DNA is actually ended up in the nucleus, because I told you there's one more uh, barrier. We don't know that. These are recent data. So, very exciting time for nanoparticle mediated uh, uh, drug delivery. And I want to thank NCI for the support. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions if you have. Yes, sir. Um, how uniform are your particles in size? 
there was uh, one slide. Um, they're very uniform. And they're very small. They're about the core, the core of the particles, about 20 nanometer. And if you count the membrane and the peg, it's about 30, 30 nanometer or so. They're very uniform. The, the uh, uh, polydispersity index is very low, 0.2. It's, it's, it's very good. And the, I show that slide to a colleague of mine who worked with adeno-associated virus. And he thought, wow, you begin to work with virus? And because he worried that I would compete with him. I said, no, 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 no. This is totally non-viral. Totally non-viral. The structure is similar to envelope virus, though. You know, you have a core that contains your nucleic acid. And then you have a membrane. So similar to an envelope virus, but it's not virus at all. So totally artificial, engineered. How do the leaky vessels allow nanoparticles to detect them? OK. Just by, um, by uh, diffusion. So they, when they go through the tumor, so the trouble of um, nanoparticle delivery through the blood to the tumor is that the tumor vessels are not that many. So unlike liver, liver has a lot of vessels. Almost all of the blood in our body will go through the liver very efficiently. But the tumor just does not contain that many vessels. Only a small fraction of the total blood will go through the tumor at any given time. And that's why you need to stay in the circulation for a long time be able to encounter that vasculature. But if the tumor contains a leaky vasculature, then they can go inside the tumor. So this is a totally by chance. Okay? But if you have a targeting ligand, not only they get inside the tumor, they will bind to the receptor. In this case, the sigma receptor. But you can use other type of ligand for other type of receptor, and then followed by endocytosis. So the real delivery is still endocytosis, going inside the cell. Yes? Yes, sir. I just have a question. Um, did, so the nanoparticles that you injected for the is it LPD2? Yeah, the, yeah. the uh, calcium phosphorus. It, 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 yeah, it inhibits the growth of the cancer cells, yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, both LPD and LCP, both. Okay, yeah. Um, the whole question of that is, um, when you deliver the drug, does it at all inhibit uh, the ability for cancer cells to metastasize? Wow. No. Uh, these uh, sRNA is hitting some oncogenes, which controls their growth, not controlling their metastasis. So if you wanted to inhibit the metastasis, then you have to use the other type of sRNA, you know, that targeted to the met metastatic genes. Yes? Uh, so you use uh, quite a, uh, a lot of number of different lipids, right? The charge is, of course, important. Yes. And does the fluidity of the, the, you know, the phase transition also play a role in the delivery? Yes. Um, do you understand what he's talking about? This must be a professor. <laughs> 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 um, these, the membrane, uh, no matter the cell, cell membrane or artificial membrane like a liposome membrane, uh, made of uh, uh, lipids. So depending on the composition of the fatty acid in the uh, lipid, the fluidity of that membrane changes. So if you have an unsaturated fatty acid in that lipid, then that membrane is quite fluid. You know, the viscosity of that membrane is something like uh, a uh, 1040 uh, 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 motor oil, you know, if you still add oil to your uh, engine. Um, on the other hand, if you use a saturated fatty acid, then the packing of these uh, uh, lipid in the bilayer is very tight. That makes the fluidity much lower or membrane more rigid. It's a very good question. Yes, it is dependent on that. If you use a saturated uh, uh, lipid, the, uh, the uh, release effect of sRNA. The, the targeting effect to the uh, tumor is the same. But the release effect 
of the sRNA is much less. We think the reason why is because the pig molecule, although we want to be of a dense pig molecule, I didn't have time to talk about that. But think about it. After the liposome, uh, the nanoparticle go inside the endo endosomes, the pig has to go, has to shed, has to, has to leave to expose the cation lipid. And that cation lipid has to then interact with the endosome membrane and make the endosome membrane leaky. So that shedding rate is actually controlled by the fluidity of the membrane. So we think that's the reason, but we haven't tested it yet. No proof. It's only a hypothesis. Thank you. Any more question? I think we're running out of time here, but uh, Dr. Hua will be here for another 20 minutes. So if uh, those of you who have more questions, please come see him afterwards. Uh, for now, let's please give a warm thank you to Dr. Hua.